It is Rumpo and the right to silence. I believe, and Rumpo believes, that the right to silence is an absolutely essential part of uh, our criminal law, both in America and in England. And really, the message of this story is that people may have totally other reasons for not wishing to say where they were at a certain time and a certain place, and it doesn't necessarily prove that they're guilty. But it is very important that the right to silence is preserved and is being rather pecked away at now in the English law. <laughs> Many dreaming spies around Gunster University. More like a concrete nightmare. Shrumpo! <clears throat> Honours degrees in the School of English. Russell Anwar Banerjee. <clears throat> Richard Arenko Jones. Orton's next. Audrey Wistein. First class degree in English. You never got a first in anything, Rumpo. In my experience, judges have got a first class degree whenever the slightest use down Oxford Magistrates Court. Yes, well, uh, that may be so, Mrs. Rumpel, but nevertheless, they are destroying our universities. Oh, you should see what they're trying to do to the law, Professor. We're going to be left with nothing but computer courses and business studies. Mm. Our masters are not interested in literature. Or trial by jury, or freelance barristers, or the right to silence. Oh, shush, Rumpel, you're not down the bailey now. The right to what? <laughs> silence. You see, if you're accused, you can stay quiet, make the prosecution prove their case. That's what they want to abolish. Bang goes freedom. The law has to work with business efficiency, just like a bank. Most of the people reading English are going into banks. Well, what can you expect, Audrey? The vice-chancellor, like Hayden Charles, who writes books about money. Yes, and spends most of his life licking the boots of our chancellor, Sir Dennis Tolson, the head of that great cultural institution, Tolson's Tasty Foods. Oh, Professor Benton, they do really rather a good frozen curry in the Gloucester Road, Tolson. Oh, don't remind me. Perhaps they do, Mrs. Rumpole, but they don't do Latin. They haven't said anything yet, but I may be the last professor of classics the University of Gunster will have. Onus probandi, in flagrante delicto. Classics to go, yet the right of silence will be next. I wonder if even Wordsworth is safe. Wordsworth ended up a Tory. But yet I know, wherever I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. He can still bring tears to the eye. And what is the point of tears? The purpose of literature, my dear sir, is to promote social change. Your precious Wordsworth ended up betraying the French Revolution. Oh, well, if you say so. Excuse me. Clyde Lipton's a wonderful teacher. What did you think of him, Uncle Holmes? I think... I think I claim the right to silence. Come along, Rumpel. The Vice-Chancellor wants us to meet him. Have you any plans for the media future? Oh, this is my aunt and uncle, oh. Mr. and Mrs. Rumpel. How do you do? I'm How Hayden do Charles. How do you do? Have you met our Chancellor, Sir Dennis Tolson? No, we never met. How do you do, Mr. Rumpel? How do you do? You must be delighted to have those results. Well, we are. We are very proud. Nice meeting you. Nice yes. meeting you. Thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Bye-bye. Tell me, dear, who is that lady? She was a little mixed up. That's Mercy Charles, the Vice Chancellor's wife. And she used to be a model. A model wife? Or a model model?
Oh. Hello, Bonner. You're working late? No, I'm just arranging my famous collection of priceless foreign stamps. Oh, are you? Oh, of course I'm not. Yeah, I, I just called in to put this away in my room. This what? Uh, this bag. Oh, that. I wanted to speak to you. I, I mean, Rumpole, how do you find marriage? Uh, in my experience, you don't. It finds you. It comes creeping up unexpectedly and seizes you by the collar. How's my tea? My wife was a tremendously popular figure, wasn't she, when she was serving as matron down at the Old Bailey? Oh, damn hand with the elastic glass, as far as I can remember, yes. Yes, much loved, wasn't she, by all you fellows. Ah, well, let's say highly respected. Highly respected. Yes. Rumpole. Yes? What's your opinion of secrets in married life? Absolutely essential. Well, I wanted your opinion, you see, because of a slight, um, well, difference that has arisen between Marguerite and myself. Who the hell's Marguerite? Marguerite, Rumpole, is my wife. Uh, she's the person you call Matey. Oh, matey, why didn't you say so? Yes, well, you see, um, she called into chambers after her refresher caught in sprains and fractures, and Henry told her I'd already left at five o'clock. You knocked off early. And he thoughtlessly added he imagined I'd gone home because I was carrying my tartan bag. He meant this very bag, Rumpole, this one. Now, it's most unfortunate that Henry should have mentioned this bag at all because I never take it home. Oh, no, of course. And now, now, Marguerite keeps asking me, where am I going with that particular bag? Now, I've told her, there are certain things, even in married life, that a man is entitled to keep to himself. Now, am I within my rights, Rumpo? Your right to silence has been yours since Magna Carta. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad to hear you say that as a married man. <laughs> Of course, it doesn't stop the other side thinking the absolute worst. Ah, yes. Now, just at the moment, you see, that seems to be exactly what she thinks. Now, really, uh, she needs something to take her mind off it. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, it would make a, a, a tremendous um, difference to Marguerite's happiness if she saw more of you fellows in chambers. Oh, well, she can see us at any time. Not that we're much to look at. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No, no. It, it would be a terrific help. If you and Hilda were to invite her to dinner at your place. I don't understand. You are telling me in confidence that Matey would like to be asked to dinner at Gloucester Road? Yes, yes, she would. Don't worry, I shan't say a word to Hilda about it. Rumpole. Yeah, oh, yes, all right, I suppose. C dinner with she who must. Matey has a curious sense of fun. What have you got in my bag? Yes, bad news. Yes. Pollard's invited himself and Matey to dinner. I begin to feel for that man's sanity, Hilda. He's creeping around with a sort of tartan hold all, the contents of which he refuses to divulge. Makes him look like a Scottish pox doctor. She's got no one else to turn to, Rumpo. Her mother left home and her father didn't even bother to show up to her graduation. And she has heard about some of your wins. What are you talking about? Well, what are you talking about? Well, well I... I... Well, you'd better come in. Tell you herself. Oh, Sir Horace, thank God you've come. They've arrested Clive. Clive? Professor Clinton, you remember? Oh, yes, the academic revolutionary. He wants you. At his trial. A oh, very wise choice. What's the crime? Driving while tiddly? <laughs> they say it's murder. He thinks you'll understand. Oh, yes, I do understand a bit about murder. No. He says he thinks you'll understand about keeping silent. You can rest assured, Mr. Rumpel has a fine record when it comes to murder. I've won more murders than you've had degrees, Professor. And so have your, uh, your clients. They kept silent? Yes, when I thought it was right. Yes, well, it's right now. Uh, I will decide that when I know a bit more about it. I've decided already. Professor Clinton, you have one hour of my time. What shall we do? Discuss Wordsworth? If you like. No, we shan't agree about Wordsworth. Let us discuss the late Vice-Chancellor, Mr. Hayden Charles, a slightly built man who crashed through some worm-eaten banisters to his death 
on a marble floor below. Pushed, no doubt, by a stronger opponent. You didn't like him? No, I didn't like his money mad politics, nor the way he ran the university. And Mrs. Charles? A very dear friend. As a matter of fact, she reads a lot of poetry. You know, she's quite bright. For an ex-model. Yes, I'm quite bright for an old Bailey hack. I think I see motive rearing its ugly head. I don't understand. Oh, do you not, Professor? Husband finds out about his beautiful wife's infidelity. Has it out with the lover in his study on the first floor of his house. A row develops and moves out onto the staircase. It grows violent. The lover is a stronger man than the husband. He takes him by the throat. That's where they found some bruising and pushes him against some banisters. Unlike the rest of Gunster University, they are not made of reinforced concrete and they collapse. End of outraged husband. Lover runs down the stairs and out into the night and that, my lord, is the case for the prosecution. Yes, well, the prosecution can believe that if they like. And if the jury believe it. How can they? They have no evidence. Ms. Probert, will you read Mrs. O'Leary's statement to this fellow? I have been housekeeper at the Vice-Chancellor's house for ten years, and before that I worked for Mr. and Mrs. Charles in Oxford. Blah, 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 blah. I have observed an intimate friendship develop between Mrs. Charles and Professor Clinton. Blah, blah, blah. I heard quarrelling on the stairs shortly before 10pm. I heard Mr. Charles's voice and another man's. All I heard the other man say clearly was something about licking the Chancellor's boots. I am quite sure I recognise Professor Clinton's voice. And do you believe that I'm the man she's talking about? Well, it seems probable, doesn't it? They're the exact words that I heard you use in the presence of at least half a dozen other people at uh, tea and sandwiches that afternoon. Mrs. O'Leary says she heard the doorbell ring at 20 minutes to 10. Uh, Mr. Charles called out that he would answer it, so she did not see whoever it was that arrived. Was it you? No. And then, Professor, you would have to tell us exactly where you were and what you were doing between 9.30 and just after 10 that evening when Mrs. O'Leary discovered the vice chancellor dead. Where were you that evening, Professor? Oh, very well. Keep quiet. You are entitled to. But there is just one line of Wordsworth that it might pay you to remember. All silent and all damned. Well, I must have your advice. Oh, you too, Erskine Brown. I ought to start charging. Billy is back. From doing a corrupt policeman in Hong Kong. Oh, splendid. She can buy us a bottle of uh, Pomeroy's bubbly on the Oriental Constabulary. We shall celebrate. Absolutely nothing to celebrate. In view of what she found when she got back, I'm afraid I had left, carelessly, on the kitchen table... Yes? ...two programmes for Tristan and Isolde at Covent Garden. Pretty scurrilous reading. Was our Portia shocked? When she asked you, I'd taken to the opera. Ah. Well, of course, I'd been with Liz Probert, as you yes. remember. We had a talk about the future of Chambers in the crush bar at the interval. Well, of course, when your wife heard that, she decided not to press charges. Ah, uh, well, now, that's exactly the trouble, Rumpel. She, she didn't hear that. In fact, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't tell her that. I told her I took Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom? Exactly. To five hours of unmitigated Wagner? I'm afraid so. You must have eaten of the insane root. What takes the reason, prisoner? Well, now, look, this is the point, Rumpel. I knew that Philida wouldn't have taken kindly to the idea of Lizzie and me drinking champagne in the crush bar. Uh. Although absolutely nothing happened. I mean, Lizzie bolted off down the underground almost as soon as the curtain fell. She even left me with her programme, which is why I had two. But, on our way from Chambers earlier, we met Uncle Tom. And he said it was his birthday. So when Philida asked me for an explanation... Uncle Tom just sprang to mind. Oh, Erskine Brown, have your long years at the criminal bar taught you nothing? If you must invent a story, at least make it credible. Well, the point is, if Philly asks, Uncle Tom has got to back me up. Someone has got to explain the whole thing to him. Who has? Someone he respects. Yes? Who has some influence over him. Yes. You, Rumpel. No. Persuade Uncle Tom to commit perjury? Certainly not. You won't do it. I, do your own dirty work, Erskine Brown. 
I suppose I'll have to. You should never have thought of such a ridiculous defence. She asked me to explain the two programmes. What else could I possibly have done? Claim your right to silence. Everyone else seems to be doing it. The wonderful thing about marriage, you'd agree, Hilda, is telling each other everything. I'm sure when old Horace climbs into bed with you at night... You don't care for Big Jam Roll, Mrs. Bellart. Big Jam Roll is on the naughty list, I'm afraid. We've all got to watch our tummies, haven't we? Uh, Marguerite is very keen on keeping fit. And I must say, I'm with her, 100%. Uh, I've already lost a lot of weight. Yep. My trousers hang loose. Look. No, thank you, Bernard. Sam's a new boy, of course. But we're old hands at marriage, aren't we, Hilda? When I was married to poor Henry Plumstead, who passed away, we told each other every little thing. We just knew all there was to know about each other. I'm sure old Horace would agree with that. Ah, now, old Horace isn't so sure. As regards the nearest and dearest, um, a profound ignorance is probably the best recipe for a happy marriage. You have quite finished, haven't you, Rumpel? Sam leaves his chambers early, carrying a zipper bag, full of something. He doesn't come home. Later, when he does, the bag doesn't come with him. But I, I hardly think this has anything to do with me, Mrs. Ballard. Oh, don't you? When I ask Sam what he's up to, and he tells me, old Rumpole takes the view that married people are entitled to a little privacy. Rumpole says we all have the right to silence. Well, you heard him, even in married life. It seems he takes sides with husbands who are up to tricks. Do you approve of that, Hilda? Approve? Well, now you come to ask me, no. I'm glad you said that. Um, my old uncle used to live in Gunster, funnily enough. <laughs> Amusing. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, he used to be an estate agent up there, but he had to give it up. He said you couldn't get anywhere in Gunster unless you were an ostler. A what? An ostler. The ancient order of ostlers. It's rather like the Freemasons, only more so. Well, my uncle didn't hold with it, so they squeezed him out. Well, did he tell you what they did, these, uh ostlers or whatever they call themselves. <laughs> All sorts of secret ceremonies, I believe. Mumbo-jumbo, Uncle Marcus said. And they also had a very peculiar handshake. Uh, he showed me. Like that? Yes. Yes, I rather think it was. Yeah, I might go up north and investigate the scene of the crimes. Oh, is that the coffee, Hilda? Do you take sugar, Marguerite? Just one tiny spoonful. I shall be going up to Gunster tomorrow, Hilda. A gunster, Hilda, it's in the north of England. I shall probably be taking my junior with me. Uh, do you take sugar, Mr. Bella? Yes, please, Hilda. No, thank you, Hilda. Ms. Liz Probert, you won't mind that, will you? My solicitor will chaperone her. And uh, are they still keeping you busy, Mr. Ballard? In Daddy's old chambers. So I won't be here tomorrow night, Hilda. You won't be lonely, will you? The rest is silence. You spend your life! Licking the Chancellor's boots. Now, oh, do you hear that? Say. Could you tell it was me? Oh, it was you, all right. Just the sort of thing you would say. Oh, that's interesting. Well, go back. I'll do it again. This time I'll run down the stairs and across the hall. Did you say run, Rumpo? Ha, ha. Move fairly rapidly. I'll slam the front door behind me. See if you can hear that. All right. Come on, Mr. Beasley. You were kind enough to say we might inspect the scene of the crime. Rather a long inspection. Uh, well, crimes take such a short time to commit, and so terribly long to investigate. Do you think Professor Clempton killed your husband? Do you think he'll get him off? The professor refuses to tell us where he was on the night in question. At the moment, he's not being very helpful to me. What do you want me to do about it? Well, he could be keeping quiet to protect a woman. Rather an old-fashioned idea, I suppose, but it's possible, isn't it? That Clive was with me and doesn't want to tell anyone? Hmm. Is that what you want me to say? Then I'll say it, if that's what you want. Is it true? What's the matter to you if it's true or not? You're a lawyer, aren't you? It's your job to get Clive off. I said I'll help you. Isn't that a fair offer? You spend your life licking the Chancellor's boots. Crash! Good afternoon. Uh, we are engaged in a history 
of the fair city of Gunster. Uh, do you have anything on the ancient order of ostlers? Orders of what? Ostlers. People who look after horses. Although I doubt whether there'd be many blacksmiths left among them now. No, more like uh, chairman of committees, planners, property developers, chief constables, <laughs> even, dare it be said, heads of universities. Well, important people in the long history of Gunster. I'm quite sure we haven't got anything like that. What? Your library is silent on this important subject? Nothing about it at all. Uh, indeed, I haven't even heard of these grooms or whatever it is you're talking about. Mr. Rumpole, you're asking about the ostlers. Ah, the classics, Prof. Are they, Magusta? Or words to that effect. Uh, this is Miss Liz Probert, my junior on the uh, Clinton case. Martin Wayfield, we met at the degree ceremony. Now, in my humble opinion, it's a load of nonsense. Uh, the degree ceremony? No, the ancient order of horse coaters. I tell you, I was once coming out of the gents in the Gunstrap Hotel. Professor Hotel, Hotel, and these silence, silence, please. What did you say? I mean, no talking. You know the rules of the library. Come over by the window. The students won't hear us there. Well, carry on, old darling. You interest me strangely. You were just coming out of the gents' loo. And one of these fellows in a leather apron and gauntlets and a bloody great gilded horseshoe hung round his neck mm. was just about to slink into the private dining room to swear mm. some terrible oath of secrecy or to offer to have his throat cut if ever he let on what they get up to. They do that, apparently. <laughs> well, this chap used to be the university registrar. So I called out, Hello, Simpkins, your old lady cast a shoe, has she? He bolted like a rabbit. <laughs> Tell me, the late Vice-Chancellor, Hayden Charles, was he a member of the Brotherhood? Mm, Hayden always laughed about them. No, I'm sure he wasn't. Mm. I wanted to ask about Clive Clinton. Is he popular in the university? The lefty students love him, and there's plenty of those. Nelson Mandela and Clive Clinton, they're top of the pops. <laughs> You've probably heard stories about his private life. Yes, are they true? Why not? Mercy Charles is a very attractive woman. Yes, everyone says that. Do you think she finds him a very attractive man? In mulier cupido codicit amante, in winto et rapida scribera rapporte tacta. Not everyone says that. What does it mean? But what a woman says to her lusting lover, it is best to write in wind and swift flowing water. It's all there, in the Latin. And it's going to be forgotten when they abolish the classics. I ought to get back to my catullus. <laughs> yes, give me my regards. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor. You've been most helpful. You've hurt your hand. What? Oh, no, no. Nothing wrong with it at all. Ah, oh. oh, uh, You back from the scene of your crime? Yes. Uh, I imagine you're uh, just on your way to yours. Yes, Rumpole. All right, old darling, not a word to make him. Mr. Justice Ollie Oliphant comes from up north, somewhere near Gunster, specializes in down to earth common sense. Always prepared to call a spade a bloody shovel, long before anyone's sure whether or not it's a toothpick. Now, when you were in the dining room on the night of this murder... Oh, my lord, I must object. No one has proved it was murder. It might have been anything from manslaughter to an accident. Oh, come, come, Mr. Rumpole. The jury and I'll use our common sense. Mr. Morton Bissett is simply using the word on the indictment. To use the word before it is proved, my lord, is not common sense. It is uncommon nonsense. If the defence is going nitpicking, Mr. Rumpole, we'll call it an incident. Will that satisfy you? It is not I that have to be satisfied, my lord. It is the interest of justice. Oh, come along, Mr. Morton Bissett. Let's get back to work, shall we? Well, Mr. Rumpole's had his say. Uh, Mrs. O'Leary, you've told us that you could distinguish some of the words the man on the stairs was shouting, and that you heard him say something about licking the Chancellor's boots. I heard that, yes. Could you recognise the man's voice? I'm sure I could. Whose was it? It was his voice. You mean it was the voice of Professor Clinton? I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Have you any questions you want to put to this witness, Mr. Rumpel? Uh, that is what I am here for, my lord. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Mrs. O'Leary, did you hear any other words you could distinguish from Mr. Charles' assailant? I heard him say, oh, loudly. Oh, yes, and then what? Well, 
It sounded like temporary. And then there was another O. And then I think I heard more is. Does this make any sense to you, Mr. Rumpole? No, not at the moment, my lord. So this evidence is brought out merely to puzzle the jury, is it? Or perhaps to test their powers of deduction. Now, Mrs. O'Leary, you said you heard a man shout something about licking the Chancellor's boots. She's told us that. Yes, my lord, but I would like to suggest when Mrs. O'Leary heard it. You heard it in afternoon tea, didn't you? When you were helping passing around sandwiches to the graduates and their families. You heard Professor Clinton say that the Vice-Chancellor licked the Chancellor's boots. It was said quite clearly. Oh, come, come, Mr. Rumpole. How do you know it was said quite clearly? You weren't there, were you? As a matter of fact, my lord, yes, I was. But I am not here to give evidence. This lady is. You heard it at tea time, didn't you? Yes, I did. I thought it was a disgusting thing to say about Mr. Charles. So when you heard those same words again at 10 p.m. coming from the hallway, you naturally thought that it, uh, it was Professor Clinton shouting. I thought so, yes. Because it was something you'd already heard him say. I had, yes. And uh, if you heard those same words again at night from a man you never saw, you would naturally assume it was Professor Clinton. I suppose so. Even though you couldn't really recognize the voice. I think I recognized it. You think you recognized it. Thank you very much, Mrs. O'Leary. Mrs. O'Leary, let's use our common sense around this, shall we? You told Mr. Morton Bissett that you were sure it was Professor Clinton's voice. Yes. And you told Mr. Rumpole that you think it was. That's right. So does it come to this? You think you're sure? Yes, I suppose mm. so. Common sense, members of the jury. It always does it, you know. No further questions, my lord. A mod on to, darling. A word in your pink and shell like. Why did the prosecution start this case in London? Well, we've got to a North Country judge. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Now, what I mean is, the defence sometimes asks for a case to be moved because of local prejudice against the accused, but this time the prosecution's done it. Did you think that against a jury might be prejudiced in favour of Professor Clinton? Now, why should that be in Gunster? No comment. Are you Christopher Perkins? Yes. Did you graduate with first class honours in business studies last July? Yes, I did. Speak up, lad. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I did. On the night of the incident when the Vice Chancellor died, were you crossing the quadrangle past Tolson Buildings? Yes. What did you see? Well, I'd looked at my watch as I was due to meet a friend at the JCR, and it was just 9.15. Then I saw Professor Clinton coming out of his rooms, and he seemed to be in rather a hurry. Oh, and he was carrying a bag, I remember. There's no need to shout. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Oh, we haven't heard about the bag. What was it like? Oh, just an ordinary zipper hold or I thought he was on his way to play squash or something. On his way to play squash? Of course, I didn't know what was in it. Three, six, two. Ah, uh, Rumpole. Uh, no, Henry, excuse me, late. Uh, hello. Ah, Gunster University. I want to speak, please, uh, to Miss Audrey Whiston. Whiston with a W. Uh, she's a postgraduate. Hmm? Oh, the, uh, the English department. Yes, I'll wait, thank you. Going down the pan in our versus Clinton, Mr. Rumpole? Uh, sinking with all hands, Henry, unless I can pull off a miracle. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, Audrey. Uh, Henry? Note. Audrey, uh, it's, your, it's your Uncle Horace. Yes, how are you? Fine. Uh, look, do you want to help the professor? Good. I want you to get into his room. Of course you can. Well, say that his lawyer needs something for the trial.
My lord, I have given notice to my learned friend of my intention to call an alibi witness. And you don't object, Mr. Morton, does it? No, my lord, I have no objection. Very well, then. Dennis What? What's happening? I forbid this! I absolutely forbid it! Mr. Paul, Miss Robert, go and hold his hand, will you? No, I won't have it until you are what? Quiet! I swear by mighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Are you, Sir Dennis Felton? I am. Stop it! What does he think he's doing? Mr. Rumpole, control your clients. Mr. Rumpole does know best. No! Mr. Rumpole, your clients creating a disturbance. Oh, is he really, my lord? I, I, I'm so sorry. It's these literary fellows, they have a very excitable nature. Ah. Well, he's not getting excitable in my court. Do you understand that, Clinton? Any more of this nonsense shall be taken down to the cells. Now. Did you say Sir Dennis Tolson? Yes, my lord. Well, well, some of us do our weekly shop up at Tolson's Tasty Foods, don't we, members of the jury? <laughs> and it may interest you to know, Sir Dennis, I come from your part of England. Is that so, my lord? Oh, yes, I used to practice often at the old Gunston Assizes, you know. <laughs> I never dreamt I'd find myself sitting down here at the old Bailey. Yes, it came as a bit of a shock to us, too, old love. <clears throat> Sir Dennis, do you attend here by summons? It was served on me last night. It was most inconvenient. Yes, I'm very sorry, but it would be most inconvenient if my client had to go to jail for a crime he did not commit. Are you an ostler? Is he a what, Mr. Rumpel? A member of the Ancient Order of Ostlers, my lord, an organization with considerable power and influence in the city of Gunster. By the great blacksmith and forger of the universe. Uh, that means you are. He does not permit us to reveal our secrets. Ah, well, don't bother about the great blacksmith for the moment. His lordship is in control here, and he will direct you to answer my questions. Provided they're relevant. Have you anything to say, Mr. Borden, please? I think the defence should be allowed to put its case, my lord. We have to consider the um, Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal? Yes, of course we have to. Well, get on with it, Mr. Rumpole. Jury don't want to be kept here all night, you know. Are most of the important people in Gunster members of the Oslers? Our Oslers are men of talent and ambition, yes. And is membership a path to promotion in local government, say, or perhaps the university? An Osler will do his best to help another Osler, yes. All things being equal. And all things being equal. A professor of English might do well to join you if he had his eye on a vice-chancellorship, say, in the fullness of time. Professor Clinton is one of our members. If that's what you're getting at. That's exactly what I'm getting at, Sir Dennis. Thank you very much. Now tell me, did the Oscars have a meeting on the night that Hayden Charles met his death? As a matter of fact, we did. At what time did the meeting begin? Our normal time, 9.30. Where was it? The Gunster Arms Hotel. At what time did Professor Clinton arrive? About 10 minutes before the meeting was due to begin. And that's 9.20, when Hayden Charles was still alive. What time did he leave? We broke up around midnight. The, um, we had a few drinks when the meeting was over. And by 11 o'clock, the police had arrived and found Hayden Charles dead. So Professor Clinton was with you all that time, from 9.20 until midnight. Yes. He initiated a couple of candidates. Yes, thank you, Sir Dennis. You may keep all the rest of your secrets intact. Yes, Mr. Morton, that's it. Uh, Sir Dennis... Can you be sure Professor Clinton was with you the whole time, from 9.20 until midnight? Of course, I'm sure. And how what on earth, earth was a decent left-wing professor doing down. with a load of old businessmen in Oakland? Well, 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 Miss Probert. I see that he is no longer fit to be mentioned in the same breath as Nelson Mandela. Perhaps that's why you'll never forgive me for getting him off. He's lost the young. Silly darling, there you are. Yes, here I am. I saw Uncle Tom. Oh, did you, darling? How was he? I asked him if he'd been to the opera with you. Oh, did you? Why did you do that? I wanted to find out. But I told you I went to the opera with Uncle Tom, darling. Surely my word was good enough for you. No, Claude, your word was not enough. I had to find out. I thought you'd given that up. Given up finding out? <laughs> given up smoking. Oh, well, I had, yes, until this happened. Until what happened? Until I talked to Uncle Tom. He didn't tell you that he went to Cotton Garden with me? Oh, yes, he did. Mm. 
You said you've been very kind and taken him to a show. Well, then. That's all right, then, isn't it? Is it? Isn't it? Of course it is. You can always trust me, Philly. Good old Uncle Tom. He told you we saw Tristan and Isolde together, hmm? In a way. What do you mean, in a way? He said it was a show about Tristan and some other chap whose name he couldn't remember. I said I'd hardly call Isolde a chap. Well, perhaps his memory's gone a bit. His memory seemed perfectly clear. He said you'd have an absolutely splendid evening. There, now. I'm delighted you enjoyed it. Oh, yes, he did. Mm. He said what a wonderfully happy show it was. Would you call Tristan and Isolde a happy show, Claude? Is that the word that would spring immediately to mind? Happy bits, of course. Perhaps not entirely happy. Perhaps bloody miserable. Oh, and Uncle Tom told me he was whistling the tunes all the way home. He actually sang one of them to me. If you were the only boy in the world and I were the only girl, nothing else would matter in the world today. We would go on loving in the... But we wouldn't, Claude. I'll tell you that for nothing. We certainly would not. Philly, please, come back. Please. Marguerite was insistent that I keep down what she calls my naughty tummy. Uh, and she talked of practically nothing else. Oh, don't I know. Well, well, in the end, I could stand it no more. I saw an advertisement for this studio. It seemed very jolly. Uh, music and, uh, you know... Young lady. Yes. Uh, well, that's why I kept it from Marguerite. I thought she might not appreciate that aspect of it. Oh, I don't know, Ballard. I think she might admire your heroism. Kelly got into that purple jumpsuit just for her. You've uh, lost, have you? A couple of inches. My trousers hang loose. She well, tell her of it, boast of it to her, Ballard. That's really your advice to me, Rumpo? Of course, yes, the time for secrets is past, old darling. Let it all come out into the open. Hmm. And the professor's entitled to keep silent, members of the jury. But you have had Sir Dennis Tolson's evidence. Well, some of you brought your sandwiches in Tolson's bags, didn't you? <laughs> and Sir Dennis is quite sure that the professor was at the meeting when the deceased man fell from the staircase. Well, is there any reason for inventing that? Use your common sense, members of the jury. Now, take all the time you need to consider your verdict. taking a great deal of interest in this case, Professor? Oh, why not? Clive Clinton's a valued colleague. Yes. And, uh, Hayden Charles was not such a valued colleague, was he? What do you mean? I've been thinking about those odd words Mrs. O'Leary heard. Oh, temporary, she said, if you remember. Oh, more is. Uh, as I said, I've, I have very little Latin. Uh, but didn't Cicero express his disgust with the age he lived in? Oh, tempora. Oh, Morris. Oh, our horrible times and our dreadful customs. Or oh, worse than that effect. Yes, Cicero said that, yes. And did a Latin professor shout them on the stairs, furious with the man who was going to kill off the classics at Gunst University? I don't understand what you're saying, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, do you not, Professor? Licking the Chancellor's boots, turning Gunster into a training ground for accountants and bankers. You heard Professor Clinton say that. You thought it was a pretty good description of Charles' activities. So good, in fact, it was worth shouting at him again on the stairs. Mr. Rumpole, you argued Clive's case very well. The Vice-Chancellor was taken by the throat with a very strong grasp. I've felt your handshake, Professor. He was pushed against the banisters by a man... Who thought the whole of his life, everything he believed in, was threatened. Isn't that possible? And who is suggesting this? I am. Only me. If anyone else does, I'll be glad to be the first to make them prove it. Because there's really no evidence, is there? Look, if you're... Just a rough translation from the Latin. If you're ever in uh, Gunster again, do give me a ring. 
We may have dinner together. I'll give you my number. Oh, thank you all the same, Professor, but uh, I think I'll give Gunster a wide berth from now on. Well, here's my number anyway. The jury's back, Mr. Rumpel. I think they've got a verdict. Oh, thank you. Yes. All hail Henry Erskine Brown. It was a famous victory. I thought you were sinking with all hands, Mr. Rumpel. Oh, we were, but we managed to make port safely, thanks to my impeccable navigation. He gets pretty intolerable when he wins. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, you look as dejected as my ungrateful client. You know what happened, Rumpel? Philida spoke to Uncle Tom. I hope he cooperated. Enthusiastically. He said he enjoyed Tristan, and especially the bit in it about if you were the only girl in the world. That defence was always impossible. I told you that. However, it may be all right. Oh, you're going to teach Uncle Tom the love duet, I... No, not that. I told Philly it was all down to you, Rumpel. Oh, down to me? Yes, I said that you wanted me to meet Lizzie at the Opera House to discuss the future of Chambers and suggested I should tell Philida I'd gone with Uncle Tom in case she was annoyed about me taking Liz. And, well, it may just have worked. She said it was typical of your underhand methods, Rumpel, but she's thinking it over. Uh, it's your wife, Mr. Eskinbrough? Oh, thank you, Claude. Thank you very much indeed. Philly. Well, yes. Darling, of course I love you. You know what gave me the idea in the first place? The prosecution bringing the case to London. They were afraid that the ostlers on a gunster jury would let their fellow ostler off. See what I mean? Secrets. It's extraordinary, Hilda. The secrets that people think are so important. Take my professor, for example. He would rather go to jail than lose the respect of his students by admitting he was a secret member of the Ostlers. You do follow me, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. He wanted it always. He wanted to be a hero to the young, and at the same time, he wanted the secret help of the ancient order. You see what I mean? Ah, the other professor, the Latin scholar. Yes, well, he didn't have much to say, but I could see he found it very difficult to keep quiet, exceedingly difficult. He gave me his card. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, put his number on it, and he wrote some sort of quotation. Latin, of course. Atque inter silvas academi quaere reverum. I've got my old school dictionary somewhere. I bet it still stinks of ink and cob stoppers. There we are. Hello? Yes, Vicky. Oh, Marguerite. Oh, not struck dumb after all. Rumpel told Sam to tell you. He said that. Oh. Oh. Gymnastics. A silver and wood. Yes, that must be a relief, dear. Yes. Well, yes, Rumpel can be quite sensible at times. Quiro, quiro dare to seek. I'm glad to hear that your Sam has come to his senses too. <laughs> well, goodbye. Hello, Rumpel. I hear you've given your head of chambers some sound advice. She speaks miracle of miracles. And you told him that you didn't believe in secrets between married people. Well, secrets between married couples? Oh, perish the thought. Now, uh, Verum, oh, well, that's pretty obvious. Sam's trousers hang loose. Your trousers don't hang loose, do they, Rumpo? Take up gymnastics, lose four inches round the waist. Like Sam Battle. What? Prance around in a purple jumpsuit to the sound of disco music? Oh, heaven forfend. Now, what does the... Oh, Lord, of course. This is quite well known. It's Horace. Horace. That's a coincidence. And seek for truth in the groves of Academe. Yes. There, you see, Hilda. Even the Latin professor could not keep silent. <laughs>